Hello, and welcome to the Cabin Boy Knits Woolcast. I'm Christopher. And I'm Jamie. This is another edition in our Canadian interview series. I'm so excited about this one. We are talking to Sylvia Olson. Sylvia has spent much of her time with the Coast Salish Knitters. She's a fantastic knitter. She's also a knitwear designer. And she has published over 20 books, including her newest, Unraveling Canada, A Knitting Odyssey, where she tells stories and gathers stories from coast to coast on her trek across Canada. Sylvia is a great storyteller. So sit back, grab your favorite drink, and she'll tell you her story. Welcome everyone. We are here with Sylvia Olson and Sylvia, it feels like I know you because I have read a number of your books, essays. I've watched some of your interviews. I've read some of your interviews. And so it really feels like we're friends. And <laughs> this is the first time we're meeting. And for those people out there who have not had the opportunity to do as much research and reading that I have, who is Sylvia Olson? Um, and I too, I know you too, because I follow you and I love uh, photos of knitting with kilts. Seriously, that, <laughs> that is, that's my favorite. It's my favorite. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Sylvia Olson is, um, I have lots of hats. Uh, I have been a knitter though since I was a child. Uh, but my knitting world, the Sylvia Olson in the knitting world um, sort of got regenerated when I got married and I have been living with Coast Salish people. So for the people that um, know Cowich and Sweaters, that's a hat. I sold Cowich and Sweaters. I zippered Cowich and Sweaters uh, for many years from the 70s until the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to university and I did my master's degree on the Cowich and Sweater Knitters. Um, there's a film, the, uh, the History of the Coast Salish Knitters. So I do kind of wear that hat, but I, my knitting's a lot more than that. That's just one that kind of gets, um, gets out there a lot. But um, in, in my real life, the thing that pays me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a housing specialist um, and I work in First Nations housing. That's what I do. And, and, and so with, with that, is, I think, um, just when you, you mentioned a little bit about your education and whatnot, can you talk a little bit about that and, and where, that, where that's taking you? So your undergrad, your master's, and your PhD. Yeah, I didn't graduate from high school. I got, I got married, and I married a First Nations guy and moved to a reserve. So that was really something in 1972. It, was not, uh, it, 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 it wasn't a thing. It, it wasn't. Um, so then I lived on the reserve. Uh, I lived there for about 35 years, but um, in the early 90s, I, I was really disrupted by uh, my country. I really was. You, I'm a blonde, blue-eyed, middle-class, white. I mean, I'm, you see me, I'm, I'm white. This is actually white, though. Because <laughs> I'm white. But um, so I thought, you know, I got, I got way too many questions. and I don't know where to go to get the answers. I've lived here. I've lived the world, but I need to ask the questions. So I went to university. I can't say back to university because I never graduated, but they didn't seem to mind that. They just let me in. Yeah. Um, so I, history was the kind of questions that I asked. There was, that's where I found the answers is history. Um, and so I did an undergrad in history. And then when I did my master's degree, it was like, okay, um, I have to pick something that I'm, I'm going to stick with, right? Because you got to write this great big thing. So uh, knitting. Of course, I'm going to write about knitting. And I'll tell you why I wrote about knitting is because I had lived with Coast Salish knitters for years. And I knew a story that people just didn't know. They, they mm -hmm. didn't know that knitters are the way knitters are. And it really came home to me when I was interviewing one of my old knitters friends. And um, she's talking away, talking away, talking away about knitting. And then she said, wow, Sylvia. Knitters, uh, uh, um, Coast Salish knitters are sure hard workers, aren't we? 
And then she stopped and said, and I said, you and I know that, Cecilia, but not that many other people know that knitters are really hard workers. So that's, I did that. Yeah. And yep. then I said, that's enough school. Oh my God, I'm not a, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's not my world. But then I worked in housing, like I told you, that's my job. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole ton of questions that I had there. So it's like, lots of questions. So one day my son said, I know where you're going to go, mom, you're going to go back and you're going to do a PhD and you're going to answer your questions. So I did. Fantastic. 1996, graduated in, no, 90s, no, no, no. Graduated in 2016 with a PhD. History of the topic that I've been working for years. And I did find some answers. I, I really did. That's fantastic. That, that's terrific. Can we talk a little bit about the master, your master's and, and the thesis that you wrote for your master's? Yeah. Um, and where that led? Well, um, so I, I, you know, you do something all your life and you don't really know um, much about it. So that, that's where it was. I'd lived it, worked it for 20 years by then. Um, I had this beautiful little shop behind my house in the Startlip First Nation where knitters came and went every day. So all I did, sit in my shop with knitters coming. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, so then, it, then I knew that's what I wanted to write about. So I studied the history of Coast Salish knitters. They're not Cowichan knitters, they're Coast Salish knitters because they're from a much bigger region than just Cowichan. Yeah. And, um, and I found out that, you know, that, that the story of Coast Salish knitters is about love, it's about innovation, it's about economy, it's about racism, it's about hard work, it's about ingenuity. Oh my gosh, it's an awesome story. And then, so I wrote it, and then a filmmaker friend of mine, um, a Métis woman from the prairies, Christine Welsh, um, said, I think, that's a, I think that's a movie. So, okay, let's make a movie. So um, the thesis turned into this, the history of Coast Salish Knitters, which is a, just a beautiful N um, NFB, NFB film. Yeah, And it's, you can still see it. You can just... I think you can just Google it and see it now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's I've I've watched it. It's 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 fantastic. It's it's really nice. Oh yes, and it turned into um, <laughs> that book. <laughs> we have that book. We have that book. Yes. <laughs> you didn't put them on your table. They're right over here. Yes, yeah. it turned into. I just happen to have. <laughs> honestly, you don't want to see my desk. You do not want to see, but it's there. Wow. Yeah, it turned into that as well. So I, I want to go a little back a little bit further. When so you've got there's a 17 year old girl who <laughs> moves onto the reservation, and what was that like in ter from a you know what was that like personally, and then I guess just from a knitting perspective because it definitely has influenced your knitting, and I'd love to love to hear a little bit about that. Um, well, I'll tell you, people on the reserve didn't like a blonde girl coming to live there any more we live for a, a short time off the reserve my husband and i any more than the white community that i came from liked him in 1972 uh canada like if we've come a long way hopefully we have mm -hmm. but that race divide was very very well defined in 1972 so my husband said, I'm not living in, in this world. We're going to move on to the reserve. I'm 17. I said, sure. Why? Why not? I have no idea. Okay. So I moved on to the reserve. And um, yeah, it, it, it's not like everybody wanted me to move on to the reserve either. either. But I am not um, kidding. I'm really not kidding. When I say that knitting was the thing that connected me and made the reserve home. Because when my mother-in-law, who was not pleased to be my mother-in-law when I first got married, found out that I loved to knit, that I loved making wool, that I wanted to learn to spin, that I would do anything. Um, yeah, I was her favorite person, you know, for decades after that, because we knit together. So not just her, but every woman uh, um, in Sartlip knit. And um, so pretty soon that was my, they realized that's who I was. It, I, it wasn't appropriating what they were doing. It is in my blood. That's right. who I am. And when they realized that this blonde girl was just as addicted to knitting as they were, 
it really was, um, it's the thing that, like I had a home in the knitting world, uh, in the First Nations knitting world in those, in the seventies and eighties, like mm -hmm. seriously. Amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the, just the knitting? Some, a lot of people aren't familiar with um, Coast Salish um, knitting and specifically, you know, the, the way that a couch and sweater is constructed. And it's, it's very interesting and unique. And I'm just wondering if you could share that with, with, with everyone. And there's my, uh, I, I just happen to have one hanging over. Yes, my I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've so, um, Coast Salish knitting uh, emerged. Some people think it's it's like an ancient tradition. It's not. It emerged in the, after the First World War. Um, uh, Coast Salish people were weavers, weavers with dog and goat hair, fabulous weavers. Thick wool was their thing, and they made this fabulous uh, these fabulous weavings. So when sheep came and knitting needles came and Scott. Scots came and um, and uh, school schools came and taught knitting. Um, they were they were onto it, like they were onto it right away. This this was a group of people that were ready to knit, and then they out of that came a unique. I mean, it's it's a it's it's quite a bit like um, other British knits, yep. but it's different. It's different, and it's enough different that the people who study this stuff say that it is North America's only unique knitting tradition. That's incredible. It is its own, it, it, the, the couch and sweater is unique enough to be called a knitting tradition um, by knitters, not by Coast Salish people. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Um, so as what what compare, are they? As They're you to like as you would compare to like a Fair Isle knitting or an yes. Icelandic sweater that we all know. This falls into that category. It does. It does. Aran, yeah. Tradition of its own from the yep. West Coast. And there are lots of borrowed features from those other traditions. There are, but there's enough uniqueness that they that it's not just a take off of one of those sweaters. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the uniqueness of it? What makes it unique? Um, negative space. Okay. Negative space makes it unique. So I'm not going to pick that up, but you can see it there. You can yeah. see discrete bands of pattern mm -hmm. and discrete bands of negative space. Yeah. So think Fair Isle, which it sort of borrows from. Yeah. No negative space. So when you see something... That has oh, that that has yes yeah yes discrete lines with that is the although everyone isn't like that that is what your mind is seeing when it says that's connected to to Cowichan. Mm -hmm. so they and they developed this banded just a few bands not all banded like um like fair isle and in fact i think you're scottish are you one of you guys scottish? I, I, i've got a scottish background yes yeah so and I, have, they, I have three kilts <laughs> yes i know you do <laughs> i'm french canadian so i yeah. married a scot a couple of years ago and he wears a really good yellow kilt he oh really does. he's a <laughs> He's a McLeod, so. Yeah, okay. But um, the Fair Isle, the history of Fair Isle, when you look back in Fair Isle uh, literature and you see really, really early patterning coming out, they would say when it was like this with bands of negative space, that this was before they really knew how to, um, <laughs> how, to how to do it right. And, and I'm thinking like, mm, <laughs> not so much. But anyway, um, but that is... That is the difference. Um, a lot of them were knit in the round. All of them were not knit in the round. Definitely not. No steaking, none of that. Yep. Heavy wool, but heavier now than it was then. They did knit with finer wool then. Hand spun, they made their own wool. Now they don't so much. The knitters don't so much. Um, no dyes, no dyes. Uh, and, no, and no sewing, no sewing. All, mm -hmm. knit, all knit on, all knit on. Um, those is, those are some of them. That's fantastic, yeah. and and they're what were they used for originally? Yeah, 
well, they were used for when you guys, and my people too, came from the east and came out to the damp west. Yeah. And died. They just like, it's so cold out here because it's so damp. And the truth is then put on something wool. Yes. Right? So yeah. so when the people, it's a Canadian thing, we, we, we moved west. And we moved from dry cold to lovely damp west coast. And there was nothing like the um, couch and sweater for that. And fishermen and hunters and but everybody. Yeah. Everybody needed something warm like that. And, and you need something knitted. Oh, absolutely. I think you guys have flannel shirts on. Same idea. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's cold today. It's, it's really oh, cold. Gosh, it's been cold. We haven't had much warm weather yet. So no, we haven't no, had a we have few teasers, but snow about but three, two and a half, three weeks ago, we had snow yeah. again. So Canadians know that you need wool or flannel to get through the cold. Yeah, absolutely. So well, you were talking about knitting, but what about carding and washing wool and whatnot? Did, was that part of it as well? Or was that already oh, done yeah. and it just came beautifully clean to you to, to ready yeah. to start knitting? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I moved when I first, I was 18 probably when I, by the time I moved, but very young yeah. uh, and lived right behind my mother-in-law's house. And behind her house, we put up a little trailer yeah, that was really a, a big thing for my family that I was now moving to the reserve in a little trailer. But anyway, um, um, behind her house was literally the the big fire, you know, for the pot. Yeah. And behind that was where I lived in the little trailer. So there was wool. We would go out and just go to all the sheep farms and, and collect wool from anywhere. And this is the thing, another unique thing. We didn't go picking out the best sheep's wool. First Nations people in those days went and bought wool from the farmers. We were looking for colored wool mostly. Didn't matter what state it was in. And then we would bring it home and, and um, um, separate it and make colors out of it and wash it. And so when I moved there, right in front of my house was the big pot, literally, where the washing took place. So no, my introduction to Coast Salish knitting was making wool, not knitting. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Your hands must Fabulous. have been nice. Were your hands nice and soft with all the lanolin? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then we hung it up all over the place, you know, on the fences and on the lines and on my front porch. And yeah, it's fabulous. So I've, I've watched a few uh, videos on uh, Coast Salish knitting and I've noticed some men knitting in, in the videos. And is that, can you speak to that a little bit? It's, um, it's, where do they come from? How did they get there? And who taught them, I guess? Well, the man I married knit and his mother, I, you know what? You don't get taught how to knit in Coast Salish world. You just knit. Okay. You just pick up some needles yep. and you just do it. Yeah, fantastic. My daughters, both, one reluctantly just knows how to knit. The other one has like the knitting gene. She just picks up needles and knits and so if you ask the men who taught you how to knit they might not tell you who taught you how to knit but would they know how to knit yes yeah. and in that film the history of coast Dalish knitters that's that lovely picture of of wayne and his mother the guy who drives the backhoe yeah. and he's sitting there knitting with his mother um so a couple of things um if you wanted pin money you knit. You could always knit a toque and make five bucks, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to go to a movie on Friday afternoon, just knit a toque and then you can go, right? So sure. there was that kind of immediacy around cash. Um, families all knit together, for sure, because yeah. uh, this is about, because when the sweater's done, then you, you can sell it. So everybody got in on it. Um, it was women's work. It was women's work, but that is definitely not to say that there weren't tons of men who knew how to knit. Um, not too much publicly. Not too yeah, much publicly. I ask if they're closeted knitters. They're <laughs> closeted. They, but some of them are coming out of the closet because yeah. Joni, my daughter, is going to open up the sweater shop again. Um, she's just building it. She's starting to build it. 
And she's a counselor in Sartlip First Nation, an elected council. So everybody knows her and she sells wool right now there still. But she has told uh, everybody that she will be doing, um, she will be doing knitting classes. And she has a group of men that are ready. That's so, fantastic. That is great. Yeah. So, and they're, they're saying, oh, I haven't knit for such a long time. So Joni's going to teach. That's, you might want to do another interview then when Joni teaches the Sartlet men how to knit again. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. I have a question for you. It's a, it's a show and tell kind of question. Do you recognize this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Um, so what is it? Can you tell us the story behind this? I, I can. I can. Um, so, so Coast Salish knitting, you knit a, um, you made your wool. I, so you hand made your wool. Um, and then that took a very long time to make wool. So of course, having prepared wool would then make it you'd be able to knit more sweaters, right? So um, a lot of shops started importing uh, New Zealand wool, and then you would just, you would just spin it. Yeah. Um, and then, this was after I was out of the business, then spinning also took a long time. <laughs> and they started importing um, pre-spun wool, very thick um, pre-spun wool. Um, Lots of knitters, for one, didn't like the New Zealand wool. Some do, but didn't like it. It didn't seem right to, to knit a couch and sweater or, or local sweaters with New Zealand wool. It has a very different texture, you, you, yes. you know that. It's a very different kind of a thing. Um, so it was okay. Wonder if we create a, uh, um, not super, super thick, because that kind of, it, it, it was getting too thick. Um, a hardy local wool and local meaning West Coast, meaning Saskatchewan West yes. wool, yep. um, which has a different texture than say the maritime wool yes. with, that yeah. comes out of Briggs and Little. Yeah. And then Canada has just this, Canada has this treasure, treasure. It has three treasures. Actually, it has custom woolen mills in, um, Carstairs, Alberta. It has Briggs and Little mm -hmm. in New Brunswick somewhere. And it has McCausland's in, um, in uh, you know this already, it has McCausland's in um, uh, Prince Edward Island. Yeah. yeah. And um, I have got to know Maddie, who runs uh, Custom Woolen Mills, and said to Maddie, uh, Joni, my daughter, who sells this, she, she sells this. Um, said we need to make a, a wool that the knitters are going to like so that they don't make their sweaters out of New Zealand thick. Yeah. Yep. And Maddie is just so awesome. So we did this and it's called Prairie Sea Fusion yes. because yes. Joni's business is Salish Fusion mm -hmm. because Joni is a Salish Fusion. Um, and Joni sells a lot of this now. Lots of knitters are starting to, to knit with this. It's fantastic. It's really nice. I, I, Isn't it awesome? And it, yeah, and it, really nice. it knits up and, and it, it just, it's got so much, it's got all sorts of things. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Why don't we talk about your new book? Oh, my new book. I yes. heard you have a new book out. I do. And you did this awesome, on the back of the book is this awesome little piece from you, which I'll just start by saying, Thank you. That was so cool. Well, and was, when I sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say when well, I, okay, you go ahead. <laughs> when I asked you to do it, I seriously had no idea that the book would ever be read. So I was really begging your like I said to my husband, Oh man, if if this fellow will do this, that will be such a gift. Because I had no idea that seriously that the book would go anywhere it, so. it, it is fantastic it, i loved it and it was kind of like i think you reached out to me is either before christmas or around christmas and mm -hmm. it was an amazing christmas gift and i said to jamie i was so excited by the way when yes. you sent it and i read it and then reread it and i loved it i really i i really loved it it was it was fantastic it just um and so it was very easy to write something on for you, on you that, did, but 
but it, and it's, it's on the back so you're published on the back of it so you and me are in it sort of together which is really exciting and the thing is you 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 already had her books from before yeah so even before all of this came about yeah i knew what i was getting myself into exactly and so <laughs> and it, and i had no idea oh is the the one on your thesis and it's just over there we should just grab it it's just over there um I, you know i'm i'm learning and my thing is if you've watched a few of our videos or any of them um i i love history that's been my thing always i when i travel i go places i meet people it's all about the history i don't care if there's a plaque this big i'll say hey there's a, i'll read it or if it's you know um and so i have glanced through your book because when i'm when i'm you know i pick i've picked it up quite a few times the the other book the thesis book and you know i'll start with photos and i'm fascinated by the history so i'm i'm just you know randomly reading historical facts and parts of the book um not knowing as christopher as much about sylvia olson but the new books come along and i have to be honest is i do not read a lot everyone who knows me knows that i don't but i only read history books or historical books and uh like i've read you know histories of canada and and the native peoples and um i mean i've so much as read pierre burton uh, a history of Niagara, which was, you know, the size nice. of a brick. Like, who reads a book on Niagara Falls? That's this thing. I'm not even kidding you. So he said, "Oh my gosh, Jamie, you're gonna love this book." And I'm thinking, because eh, I'm not reading fiction. <laughs> I'm not reading fiction because I don't. If I'm gonna invest that kind of time, I just don't. I can't read fiction because in my mind, it's somebody else's mind. It's not even real. And so I like something that is tangible, real, honest truths. That's why, I thought, that's why I thought you'd love this and book. And so I've been reading it. And I said to Christopher, and we'll get into that because I have a few questions. And the thing that's fantastic about the book is it's, it's very personal to you, but it has a history. Knitting's what binds it and fuses it together along your travels across Canada. But there's such honesty and it's Canadians and it's each and every community and people. It, it has everything and it has a lot of humor. I've, I mean, the first <laughs> few pages I, I giggled and I've jotted down a couple of things here we'll, we'll get into because I jotted down a few things that I'm like, that's funny. So on that note, I've-, I've I hope it was meant to be funny. <laughs> I've, I hope so, we'll find out. I'm gonna be like, uh oh. But I, I'm, I'm thrilled that I'm still, I'm not finished it because I've tried to get, I've tried to get as much of it before we had a chat into it, but I look forward to sitting it, sitting down and reading it, you know. Awesome. Word. Thank you. That was a wonderful review of the book. That was wonderful. Thank so, you. There you go. So, so why don't we start, start about just how did you, where did it come about? Where did this book come from? Like where in your, where were you um, and how did, how did, how did it all come about? Well, we did do the we we did the knitting tour in 2015, and yes. that was that was supposed to be a book tour for my book, the knitting stories. Yeah, and um, it 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 grew and grew and grew, and it became uh, all these workshops, and and then it it went all across the country, and it became this great enormous thing, um, seriously not planned, but it just kept growing because people kept saying, "Come here, come here." Yeah. Um, so. So we did that, and a lot of people ask me, "Did you do the knitting tour as kind of um, material to write a book?" And nothing is is less true than that. No, I I I don't do things to write about them. I I have so many things to write about. I, I don't have to actually yeah. create something to write about it. So no, that so that's not how it started. So we did it six weeks. 60 workshops, 40 places. Um, yeah. So when we were finished, it was like, ah, so good. This is done. So good. Um, I'm a storyteller. I'm an oral historian. So when every workshop, people told us their stories. And um, I knew enough about getting people's stories that I should write them down because not word for word, but I needed to, I, I needed to account for them because yeah. people were sharing with me. So Tex, my awesome husband and, um, and um, partner in, in uh, the, the road trip, wrote notes on, on the stories that people said. Fantastic. And, um, or told us every, 
every workshop was a storytelling workshop as much as a knitting workshop. It mm -hmm. was about storytelling. I told stories. I told the story of Coast Salish knitters that I believe Canada needs to know. Canada just deserves to know it. So I would tell stories from my knitting experience and they told us their stories. We got home, this little book, it's somewhere around here. Um, we lost it because I was like done, seriously done. Yeah. Um, and then about a year later, of course, I'm a storyteller and it's like, mm, those were good stories. Um, maybe the road trip is a story. I didn't have a story in my head. It, it really wasn't there. It, it, it's not like something started to burn. Like sometimes when I'm writing, it's like, okay, I got to write that. Um, mostly I wanted to tell the stories that I'd heard as opposed to my stories. But then as I started to realize after, and this is seriously, this is not just, this is not just fuel for, uh, um, for uh, book launches. But I realized, I did realize, because I am a very um, uh, um, uh, troubled Canadian. I have been a very troubled Canadian. You can't be a middle-class Canadian and move on a reserve and not be very, very, very troubled by your country. Mm -hmm. This idea that Canada is the best place in the world, I would go, Phew. Yeah, you guys haven't met my place. Like, come and come and visit me, and I'll I'll put that to arrest for you in a minute. So, I that is um, that it, that is who I was, and um, uh, and and then I'm British Columbian too, which is like good. I don't even have to think about Canada because you know, come over the come over the Rockies, and I don't have to be Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. I real I started to realize after a year or so, at least a year after going across Canada, that I had actually done some work on myself about being a Canadian. Uh, seriously, and and then I thought, oh, okay, well that's worth writing about. It's worth writing about um, road trips. You know, there's progression. You start here. You you know all that stuff. So yep. I thought, well, actually that happened to me. By the time I was, this sounds so like cheesy, actually. It sounds pretty cheesy. <laughs> I hope this is something you laughed at because by the time I was finished uh, writing, not the finish the road trip, you don't actually necessarily learn anything on a road trip. It's not until you write about the road trip that you, that you learn about it. Mm -hmm. So as I was writing, it was like, um, and getting to the near the end of writing, I thought I actually like this place a lot better than I thought I did. Um, I, I am much more patient with it. I am much more patient with it. Um, I, I've studied it all my life, but I, I actually get it because of the, the geography and the people and, and just the, the reality of it, experiencing it in a lived, in envi in lived living it. Um, so all that profound stuff that, you know, that somebody wants to talk about right now, it, it was real. Yeah. It was actually real. It was like, I, I could think about Canada in a different way. Well, it's interesting because, you know, a little bit about um, in the beginning of the book, you mentioned how we were talking about um, how, you know, when people think of Canada, you think of the scenery and, and oh, it's so beautiful. And along the way, there's all this beautiful scenery and this beauty out there. And you're going to just follow along. And you seem somewhat like maybe humbug about it. It's like, oh, scenery. <laughs> You know, you're going to knit and you, you, you had that project that you were going to work on that maple leaf dress. We could talk a little bit about that after. So then <laughs> you're, you're kind of humble. But then towards, you know, by the time you reached Ontario, and I want to go back to when you left Vancouver, though, because when you, by the time you reached Ontario, because you know the stretch along Superior from Thunder Bay onward, and you're, you've stopped one way. But now you're talking about, you're looking out that window and you're talking about the beauty of it all. So yeah. even... You know, you're just half, I'm that part of the book and I went a little to that. So things are already changing as you're moving from yes, probably, province yes. to province or even town to town, hasn't it? Isn't yeah, it? I, I, and thanks for picking that up. That That is probably true too. It, it is true because the muchness of a cross country road trip is like, oh my God, let's just get going. Like, let me knit, you drive, you know, Texas, Texas at the wheel. He also, we, we really got to speak about this because, um, I married Tex McLeod when I was six. I, I got married the first time when I was 17 and the second time when I was 63. Mm -hmm. So um, I married Tex McLeod 
the guy in the yellow kilt that I married. Yeah. He, he, we got married. He was in his yellow kilt. Awesome. Um, and he is a just a, he's a road tripper. He has he has tra he's got no children. He traveled the world, and he and that's what he does. He is an unbelievable um, tour guide. Mm -hmm. So uh, so he actually opened that up to me in a in a in a really very real way. And then he's from Ontario, and he loves Ontario. So. You're right. When we cross that border, it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> this is my place. And every little thing, the, the red rock, like whatever, drive by the red rock. No, oh no. You didn't know about these red rocks. No. Okay. Tell me about the red rocks. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that was another reason why by the time we cross that border into Ontario, he's Ontario. He loves Ontario. I have always had a, relationship with Ontario. <laughs> I, I, Ontario to me is like Toronto and Hamilton and, and it's like ah, so overwrought. Mississauga, so many people for a little West Coast girl, it's always been a bit much, but him, he loves it. And yeah, so I was really lucky to have such a, you know, in love with Ontario travel guide. And we, could, right. and we could say that as Canadians because we know that, I mean, I have um, a sister in Vancouver. I've been to the to the West Coast, oh, a dozen times. And when I say I'm from Ontario, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, you know, there's, there's repercussions. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's opinions. And um, it's interesting <laughs> because I know that you've mentioned, you've mentioned that book because you're, you've mentioned already in this interview how you're, you know, British Columbian. And it's true. There's, I mean, there's that divide. We know there's the Rocky Mountains and all the other mountains along the way through the Fraser Valley, Fraser Canyon and such. Um, and so there is a difference of, of in, in peoples, but you went across Canada, so you know that. But Ontario being the larger province, the, you know, the metropolis, they think, or we could say that they think they're the center of the universe, because I did live in Toronto, coming from a northern Ontario town, and I lived in Toronto for 20 years. I get that. And I think we as a Canadian people can say that about ourselves and our country, can't we? Well, it's, there's, a, there's actually a movie about, about this exact topic of Toronto feeling that it's the center of the universe, and I think it's called I Hate Toronto or it's, there's something about that but it's so it's you, you definitely feel it when you when you travel outside of Toronto now I was going and my, to my my family comes from um uh Chatham Ontario when oh, yes. okay. my family so I I'm, I'm saying it somewhat with a tongue in my cheek be yes, uh, yes. Um, because I also of course um came from Ontario at least a whole part of me did um yeah. right yeah. And, and, so, and, then, and at that, that young age bringing yourself to the West Coast and trying to integrate into this Coast Salish community. Um, I'm going to mention text again because when you when you leave Vancouver, when you leave Vancouver now, so we're going May 1st to roughly June 15th, the 15th, 16th yeah. that, that you're planning to, to, to leave. So then there's um, one unexpected quick stop before you leave. You're going to have a workshop before you leave, right? And what's interesting about that is you, you sort of mentioned how storytelling is your thing. You always are allowed in your storytelling. That's who you are. You can, it's easy breezy. But as with this, you, you're used to talking outside of your, right. outside of your community. But now you're going to have your, your kickoff back there and you're apprehensive and you're thinking. <laughs> so right. talk about that. Now you, you kick off and then you leave. No, exactly. It, it is so, so strange. Um, you you have your you have your gig, you know that you do, and now there's your sister there, right? And now now there's your neighbors are there, and now your daughters there, your couple of daughters are there, and it's like oh, um, when you're talking to strangers, you get to say anything you want, um, but there's a whole different kind of of, of vibe when you're talking to your your yeah. uh, people. It did take me a bit to to, to kind of get get over that. Um, uh yeah for sure so yeah it took us a little while to get to get off the island um and i also the second uh workshop i did was in the couch and valley so like um my stories have a different resonance in the couch and valley right this is yeah. this is they they claim this uh kind of knitting as their own and so they should but um 
yeah. So yeah, thanks so, for picking that up. That's interesting. Yeah, and, the, and the thing about um, now, just to clarify, because you said you, you were married very young and then you were married again at 63. 63. Now, remarried. Okay. So I was reading the stories. I don't know where I'm going with this. Oh, well, this is where <laughs> I'm going. I know she's, she's going, oh, no. Ah, no. So I'm reading these stories about, you know, there were a lot of stories from some of the women is about knitting these knitting sweaters. And they're knitting sweaters for their, their then the boyfriend. boyfriends, partners, husbands, what have you. And then there's the, the breaking, you know, it, it ends. So these are their stories. But there's, there's one story, two stories I'm going to maybe ask you about. And one is about um, the white buffalo sweater. If that rings a bell, the white buffalo sweater where there's, um, there's a snowflake and it's not very well knit. Oh, it's a wonderful knit. story. It's not very well knit. Mm -hmm. And then again, um, the sweater bugged her. But then oh. she, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I love this. It's, it, it, and it's true. It is a true story, honestly. It is a true story. Right. Do you want me to tell it? Yes, yes please. <laughs> okay, so we're in Vancouver and I'm just getting started. So we're, you know, women are, they love, oh, they all came with their stories. They couldn't wait to tell. We'd have 20 stories in every workshop because there's 20 people, 20 oh my stories. Gosh. Wow. I told people you are only allowed to tell me, think of an iceberg, okay? Yes. Here's your story. I only want the tip. Yeah. You can't have the whole story. So anyway, everybody got into it. Everybody loved it. So this woman said, um, um, so she has this, uh, she has this sweater that, um, so all these women are telling these, these stories, like you're saying, you know, you know, my boyfriend's sweater and, he's, and he wears it. And this woman, she looks like this and she says, well, wait a minute. Cause my husband has this ugly, ugly, ugly ass old sweater. <laughs> and he will not take it off. And she said, I am going home. Honestly, she's like, she is going to go home and I am going to talk to him about that sweater. Because <laughs> I just realized that there's something more about that sweater than that it's the <laughs> ugliest sweater in the world. It's yeah. knit badly. It's knit badly. It doesn't fit him. And he, uh, 20 years, she says, he's, he hasn't taken it off. He wears it everywhere. And when we're going out, she says, that's what she, he wants to wear. So she's like, that's it, man. I'm going home. So I kid you not, we go into the interior. We're now in the Kootenays. And now it's story time, right? Story time. And um, this extremely beautiful woman, small, you know, gracious woman says, well, the first sweater I knit was, you know, this white buffalo sweater. She described it, honestly. And I did such a bad job, you know, and the, the snowflakes were like, you know. And um, she says, I gave it to my, to my boyfriend and, uh, you know, it was so, it was way too big for him. And it was just, oh, she, and he wouldn't take it off. And, and, and I was listening to her. <laughs> Like, now, I don't know what sweater you're talking about. I really don't. But I might know your husband's new wife. I really might know. Because I heard the other side of that story. It was so awesome. That's crazy. And this is, and then I was, when I was reading it, after I read that, I even asked Christopher about that. I said, I have to ask her about that story. Because then I was confused because I then thought, it was your story, but I knew that it wasn't because you're te retelling the stories of the stories. But that's why with you're having remarried it and that and going back, I'm like, is that, is she talking about Tex? No, I'm, like, I'm not. But Tex does oh. have an old green sweater. Green Rough Rider sweater. He does have a Saskatchewan Rough Rider sweater that is yeah. full of holes. <laughs> yes. That he likes to wear. Yeah. And there was a little bit of a story there. We all have there, a, story. I had a little, story there. I had a little giggle with that as well. And I'm thinking, I wonder if the knitter of the Rough Rider green sweater tells the story that she <laughs> knit that sweater for her boyfriend. I don't know. At, it, at one of your workshops later where someone's going to say, well, I knit this green sweater once. <laughs> it happened twice. <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah. Good. We could put it out there and we'd probably find her. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely.
<laughs> so is it, did you have any surprises about was it your travel across the country and you've met so many people? Was there anything that surprised you about the people in each of the locations? Was there an overall feel or anything you were surprised at or not surprised or just with generally with Canadians? Canadians on the West Coast versus the East Coast versus the middle of the country? Are we all Perhaps, the same? Or are we different? Um, we're a bit different for sure. We are different even within our own environments. For instance, and I'm not sure, um, be careful what I say here, but the knitters in Lethbridge, say, are quite different than the knitters in, in Calgary. Yeah. So you, yep. you, you yeah. can pick up, um, and the cool part about that, we, we actually went through Alberta um, five days after they voted in the NDP. So um, we actually got some, some, pretty, um, some pretty riled up people on yeah. both sides of that fence. Yeah. So, um, but you have shops that sell a lot of, you know, baby wool and acrylics and stuff. And then you have centers that are all about really um, the kind of wool that you have behind you, um, really artistic wools. And, and so, yes, that's an economy thing for, you know, to some degree, but it's also yeah. a cultural thing that um, the whole thing about knitters are old women you know, I am an old woman and, and, I, and I knit, right? So I'm finally actually filling the, the stereotype. But um, the, there's like Gaspro Valley fibers in, um, have you ever been there? No. That you, you need to go there. That, that, yeah. This is this fabulous place in Wolfville in, 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 in Nova Scotia. Yeah. And it is full of, of these yarns that you just just die for, right? Just gorgeous, gorgeous yarns. So yes, there is differences. Oh, you know what is really interesting about the people um, is, is the yarn shop owners. And maybe you're one of those people. And I'm one of those people. And they're people that are driven by a different kind of economy, mm -hmm. a different kind of sense of value. And I mean, I don't ever apologize. I'm as political as you can get. I think politics, everybody should be. But Alternative ways to do capitalism would really suit me just fine trying to figure things out. They should actually model yarn shops because you have this community um, economy that's going on that has the exchange, Yes. but it has helping. It has all sorts of other things going on in these shops. So yeah. That was one of the things that really stood out for me. And I, and I didn't realize it until I sort of shop after shop after shop. Okay, hold on. There's something else going on here. This is a different kind of economy. It's a different kind of capitalism. It's a different thing that's going on here for these shops. Yeah. So that's actually worth repeating. Um, one of the really... Um, important things to me was to go to Newfoundland and see the Nonia knitters yeah. Yeah. Um, because to, to study another story in Canada of where knitting was part of economy in a different kind of a way. Um, um, that surprised me because it kind of disappointed me. I thought they were going to be able to have a more vibrant economy because the couch and sweaters had lost their economy and I thought that the Nonia knitters perhaps still had it. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't work there really either. Yeah. Um, in, in, the, in the sense that people can't knit uh, for a living. Um, and, and we all know that. Um, but that was brilliant going to see the, the Nonia knitters and to see how uh, another part of the country did the same thing and how women actually, um, saved their communities no yeah. uh yeah yeah, yeah made their com communities work so and, and and the health the whole health aspect of it as well you know we'll yeah. send nurses around um if it yeah. was pretty amazing so coast to coast we have these groups these two groups of knitters that um were integral to their economies that yeah. was really interesting for me too yeah you know, and it's interesting how you mentioned you know with economy and the wool types and what's going to it's always about what's going to sell or what people not necessarily what people like but like you mentioned you know like the wool from uh custom mills that 
um, you want to use local local wool, local sheep, local yarn to create that. Now, if you go back to the time um, when you're back, you know, a young woman back in Coast Salish knitting with that community, there comes a time where it's, it's almost the same as it was back then, let's say, if you think back historically. So when you arrive there, you're a young woman, and you mentioned Laura, your mother-in-law, quite a bit in the book. And I know there's something very special there. Now, if you think about it this way, where she, she and she lived to be 93, and you mentioned how she, she's knitted probably over a thousand sweaters, but there's a time, and we're going to talk a, a little bit economy and a little bit maybe tradition, which isn't necessarily, you know, they don't go together or not necessarily a good thing for the economic reasons. So there was the time that Laura mentions, the time um, there's the time before and the time after, which is when, when she was told what to knit. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? We'll get into that. So she has a history before you arrive because she had been knitting since she's a young girl and she's lived it and she's seen it. And then you come along and you've learned that history. You've seen it firsthand through her eyes. And then you also, having arrived there in 1972, you lived through a history. So the before the time of when you're told what to knit and not, there's the creativity that's sometimes lost along the way. Now there's a fusion between her history and your history and the economy and how all that changed, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so it goes from Laura, I'm the bridge. Yes. To Joni. I'm a, yes. I am a bridge to Joni. Joni is, Joni is the future. And you know what's really cool? It's, it's not in my book, but uh, Joni's youngest son, if you ask him. So he's this, uh, I think he's 11, Joey. Joseph? Joseph. Joseph. He's got long hair, you know, and, and uh, what do you want to be when you grow up, Joseph? Well, or Joey? Oh, well, I'm going to run the, sh the, the shop. I'm going to, I'm going to knit. It's like, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, so great. <laughs> so, uh, and on and on it goes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so, and our histories are, are I, I love your connection, uh, Laura's history. And, and then, and then I pick up in my history uh, and, and that 66, um, I am now seen as that, as, as uh, the, next week. the older generation. And Joni is, is, you know, she's what's happening now. That's, she is. And, and, and it's one thing to, you know, you, you mentioned the couch and sweater, which is, you know, that, that is one historical part there. I mean, there's the knitted, you know, knitted um, hats, toques, and what have you. And with the tradition, it, it's, not, it's not that historical, like you're saying. They were knitting, uh, it became, it became, they were selling the sweater. So it did become an economy and of hard working women who didn't necessarily reap all of the benefits there. But also at one point, their, their creativity, there's, there's this, reformation because now it becomes maybe a little a, a little bit about the economy or political where um what people expect and want to buy are these cow and sweaters but i mean you you come from a different area where i'm sure your creativity you want to just do your own thing and laura we call them as you call them as laura originals well everybody has that in them so you don't want to use that dyed wool coming from somewhere or here or there anywhere you want to be traditional. You want to put your own spin on things. Um, and so what, what was it that, from what you learned from Laura, that then you added your own creativity and now your daughter Joni is going to move on and have her take on all of it? Well, I see Laura as very much a kindred spirit. Um, I never knit couch and sweaters in that way as, as any, um, I sold them, I zippered them, I washed them, I repaired them. Um, I could knit them. I could knit, of course, any of them, but I, I wasn't so much the knitter of the sweater. I was the, the merchant of the sweaters. Um, but I was always looking to knit um, anything and everything. And Laura, and I think I have it in the book that I would go down to Laura's and I would bring, you know, the latest thing that I'd knit and, and she'd want to knit it. And she'd, and then she'd pick up the, the latest wool. Oh, some of it was just ghastly because in the days that there was that, um, what did they used to call, what would they call that sort of wool that's not wool and it's got, you know, it's got all kinds of crazy stuff on it and stuff. Anyway craft wool or something. Anyway. Yeah, yes, yes. 
she loved that stuff. She loved it. And she would make all kinds of crazy things out of it. <laughs> and so we had that, that was our relationship was, you know, what are you knitting? Um, and, and what are you knitting? Um, but when she wanted to make money, when she had to make money, she had to make a couch and sweater because that's what people expected. And there's no money in um, just knitting uh, like something that you've dreamt up. You're that's not going to find a, the, the buyer for that. So, so her, the economic part of it was couch and sweaters. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Did you have any more questions? Sylvia, was there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, There's a lot. I could, I, 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 I maybe, cause I, I keep seeing it kind of over my shoulder. Um, but I knit, uh, so what was his name? Harry, who's the singer that had Harry knit Styles. <laughs> Hi, Harry Styles. Yes. That sweater so, was called a multicolored sweater. Yeah, the, 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 the squares. Yes, yes. Yeah. So when I saw Harry Styles' sweater, which I thought was ghastly, just like like terribly ghastly, I, I could tell that the wool that they used was ghastly. Um, but it, it, it made this big, it was this big deal, right? So yes. I So if there's a knitting big deal, I have to take part in it. So I had a whole bunch, see my, my shell, yes. I had a whole bunch of custom woolen mills natural dyes they do the most exquisite natural dyes yes so i thought okay i'm green i am not going to make a square a, a sweater patchwork sweater out of acrylic yarn it's not going to happen and i'm not going to make it that ugly either that's not going to happen but i have all these amazing colors and i have to make because everybody's making one so i wanted to, i'm, I'm going to show it to you oh, no oh that is hysterical Oh wow. wow. That is amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Fun. It's wonderful. That is great. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's amazing. And I'm a geometric freak, so I had to put a little bit of geometrics in it. And wow. um seriously, it it is the most comfortable. <laughs> wow. So, so and, and awesome. truthfully, when I um when I did it, uh, then that's why I thought of it when you said that, um, that Laura true. would have done one. Laura would have done wow. one. She could not have lived without having done a uh, Harry Styles sweater. That is, that is so funny. Gosh. I think um, we talked about that in one of our episodes. <laughs> I just, yeah, I talked about this a couple of episodes ago because I wanted to do the, I wanted to do the exact same thing. I was, I had a picture of Harry Styles up there and it was that ghastly thing. Um, but I wanted to see if I could do that out of, naturally dyed yarn. It's, oh, it's been done, exactly. Christopher. It's been That's done. <laughs> that it's is awesome. Amazing. It looks it, great. And it's funny because I always talk <laughs> history and I'll always do a history of the, a specific breed of sheep and where it came from and how it was, you know, created and you for a new type of wool. And so I went on the history of Harry Styles and <laughs> all tongue in cheek, but I did this whole history on Harry Styles because it's like people are like, I didn't even know who Harry Styles was. And oh, so I didn't funny. either. And here you are, this, well, this person who's, who is somewhat, in our minds, a Canadian icon, and you did a Harry Styles sweater. <laughs> that is hilarious. fantastic. Had to do it. I mean, you can't, <laughs> so you can't not do it, right? Especially when you have a, a whole bank of these amazing um, yeah. uh, naturally dyed, even this blue is naturally dyed. Oh my yeah. gosh, it's so gorgeous. beautiful. That's beautiful. I feel like I've met my kindred spirit. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> through that Harry's, because I was call it, calling it, you know, your sweater, your sweater, like the coat of many colors, you know? It is and my just, coat of many colors. Yeah, it's just amazing. That's well, the, you know, and that just made me think of something because I was going to say like, here's, here's Sylvia Olson, this, and I didn't, I didn't know what word to use, but I'm going to bring it back to the book for just one last oh, time gosh. or a minute because along the way or midway through this tour you're in on, you're in winnipeg and the, the guy from the winnipeg free press i think it's called and yes you, yes and you're and you're mentioning how all of a sudden they as they said they were trying to um reshape your identity yes and they used, <laughs> terms, and they, they used terms like um i think i said it was in Leth lethbridge and and different places where the press was now following you and they're calling you a knitting crusader a guru the knitting whisperer and then, as you mentioned, an old, la an old lady 
um, and a blonde bombshell. An old lady <laughs> who gossips and a blonde bombshell. <laughs> that so, was good, wasn't it? So <laughs> which one of these two questions? One would, which one of those would you actually label yourself? And then in a word, just Sylvia Olson. What makes Sylvia Olson Sylvia? Um, what make well, Luke so monikers aren't you? I know that I so am not a blonde, I am more of an old woman than a blonde bombshell. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that was six years ago, so I'm getting to be more of an old woman than a blonde. Bombshell. Oh, come on, that's debatable. Well, <laughs> that's debatable only because I know that you mentioned I'm going to throw this in, just sort of interrupt again. So, I'm going to throw this in because blonde bombshell now you came across um, a sweater that you purchased with text in Vancouver from a European woman. And you mentioned the sweater was, you could tell the style, it was maybe 80s or something, like bom um, I think a bomber style sweater. And then you mentioned something like, okay, well, it's kind of not going to suit me now, but there was a time when I had, you know, your, your, <laughs> your, your curly perm and your high-waisted no pocket. I pain. was a blonde bombshell. <laughs> I know, I've been okay. there. Right? That's why I know I'm not there anymore. That's okay. why I'm not there. Been there, done that, not anymore. Yes. So, um, yes. so, uh, so that's, so maybe a bit of a knitting whisperer because, um, but maybe the, the antique roadshow was a bit of it, it the history of a sweater. Um, yeah. Like I'm the, you, you wanna talk about a history of your sweater, bring it to me, I will just love your sweater and, 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 and tell you everything I can make up about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what historians do. Um, <laughs> So that's who I am, um, but I am probably defined by my um, indefatigable, that's a cool word, hey, um, yeah. enthusiasm, enthusiasm, uh, um, uh, curiosity. Um, so, so there is that, that, that is, and, and I apply that to knitting. Which is why I, you know, have a Harry Styles sweater that that I had to make, right? Um, yeah, it's just there's just no end to it, and I can tell just looking at the, at, you know, the the um, look at look at look what's behind me and look what's behind you. Yeah. It never stops, right? There's yeah. it. There's always something, you know. Yeah, and this is just this is just my hobby. So um, yeah, that's so that that's me. That is me. I, I'll be around for as long as I'm around. Uh, you know. Want to do the next thing. I, I have that one last question, and we, uh, I love asking this question. Um, and it is Who is your fiber hero? So, when you think about your, your fa fantastic life, you know, who in the fiber world has had an impact on you, uh, the, the greatest impact? Um, I, I would like to, um, I would like to be able to target somebody i would it might be fan at at custom woolen mills who is this crazy woman that just works her tail off to create wool to create this fake so it might be fan um um uh, you have become one of my latest favorites seriously anybody who will put on a scarf and a kilt and i think i've seen a picture that that's it, just the scarf <laughs> and the yeah, that. <laughs> yes. yes, well, that makes you my hero because mm -hmm. that's pretty spectacular. But I would that have to say the two people that are my, and they're not in the fiber world, they're in my little fiber world, is Laura and Joni. Yeah. Um, it that's is quite good. an amazing place to be between those two incredible women that are just, just eat and breathe. So my daughter's getting a, a, a master's degree. She's got a very, very good job. Um, and she's been an elected official now for 18 years. I mean, this is a woman with like everything going for herself. Yeah. And she's, and, and what does she ask her? What do you want to do, Joni? I want to run the wool shop. That's what I want to do. <laughs> That's, That's great. what I want to wow. do. That's and great. what would her grandmother, what would my beautiful Laura mother-in-law want to do? Oh, I just want to come and sit and, and what she'd do, she'd look at, what do you do? What do you got behind there? What is that wool you've got there? What's that green? That's what she'd be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. They're my heroes. That's great. It's been so wonderful talking to you. Uh, I've learned a lot and you really are one of our um, Canadian 
heroes and icons and we love we just love everything you do and we love the voice that you carry um, it's, thank it's, you it's incredibly inspirational so just wanted to say and you guys are too you really super are this is thank very cool that. thank Thanks. you for that and i'm going to say as well i mean your 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 knowledge that you lived and learned and and the history and the um the love and it's all from the heart because it starts like as you mentioned from laura to your own daughter um that is something that you just can't put out there in words as you would like to and you try and you do a very good job at it and uh it makes you canadian beyond just british Columbian. <laughs> you are canadian as well. i am a canadian Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> right Spending i just you gotta take that the, i made it nice and long see so look <laughs> there you go that pocket is, that is awesome and sylvia Harry's I mean, doesn't have pockets that's right and sylvia you know and it's funny because i'm going i love that sweater but when i saw that one i'm going i love that sweater yeah big arms okay that I feel is inspired. Awesome. Thank you well thank you so much thank you thank you thank you so much sylvia thank you what an amazing person and a fantastic storyteller i could listen to her all day and I mean, the stories she told from coast to coast and the people she met along the way, it's not just her stories, it was their stories and she's telling them in her way, but you know, in her words, but um, a recollection of her, her, her travels from coast to coast. I mean, it was very fascinating. And what I loved, especially with her latest book, is that she didn't go out with the, the objective of, I'm gonna go out, get this experience and write a book about it. Yeah, she mentioned that. It just, she had so many, so many experiences and, and and the storytelling that was told to her, she thought they were so worth repeating. Yeah. And that's, I think, what uh, prompted her to just say, I, I should just put this down in, in words. And it was a very organic process. How do you mean organic? Because it just it just grew. Like she didn't plan it in advance. It just it just um, developed. And it developed actually, at, at, it started percolating after she got home. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, she she is funny. She had some. I oh mean, my gosh, the stories she's, are she's, funny, she's, but it's her, yeah. the sense of humor in everything that she every along this, every step of the way. Yeah, um, I I got a kick out of that for sure. I mean, lines like uh, that I could relate to. I knew she was a kindred spirit when she said, "Then as in now, I kept my eyes peeled for a glimpse of a real cowboy coming into the prairies," and I thought, "I like her," because <laughs> you had the similar th thoughts, I'm sure. <laughs> so, did you ever expect? that she would pull out a Harry Styles sweater. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's when you became a, her new kindred spirit. Yeah, she was a kindred spirit. Because we talked about Harry Styles. You're talking about using your colors to make a Harry Styles sweater. And, you know, I didn't really know who Harry Styles was. Kind of, but not really. And here's someone who's 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 been in this industry and who's been, you know, she goes way back to when she started in as a little girl. And she's knitting a Harry, she knit a Harry Styles sweater. It was gorgeous. Yeah, it was really nice. I was stunned. I would say, though, that I, that wasn't the clincher for me when we were as a kindred spirit. It was the development of this yarn. So this is Custom Woolen Mills, and uh, Sylvia worked with Custom Woolen Mills to produce this. And it is fantastic yarn. It's, it's great. And it also, you can feel Coast Salish in it when you, when you look at it, because it's very unique. And, and I absolutely love it. And that was the thing, because she talked about, you know, she talked about, uh, you know, she, she's all about history. I mean, she's done her thesis and her master's on knitting in, in her two books. One was uh, turned into a national film board, um, like, documentary story, yeah. which is fantastic. But she's saying how, you know, as time passes and people go out there and just, you know, might just grab any wool that comes from just about anywhere. But, you know, stay true to your roots and true to... Um, uniqueness of, of local wool and local yarns and local, local fibers, um, natural colors, that sort of thing. She's all about that as well. Yeah, and she also influenced a movie for, with the National Film Board. And I have grown up, and every, everyone from Canada knows the National Film Board. I love the National Film Board. They produce, it's definitely, if you want to hear a Canadian voice, it comes through the National Film Board. So I was quite excited that they were able to take her story and um, make a movie out of it. It was, uh, it's, and I saw, I've, I've watched it, it's really great. And I'll put a link to it as well so other people can access it. But the books, let's talk about the books for just a second. Sure. Uh, Working with Wool is a fantastic book and it talks about Coast Salish knitters. It's got fantastic pictures in it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful story. It's, it's a can truly Canadian story. Um, it's one that we should all know. 
and yeah. also she mentions it's, it, it, it is very unique to Canada because it's it's one of the only traditions, Canadian knitting traditions, North American knitting traditions, because yeah. you talk about Fair Isle knitting that people knows know about. Um, you could talk about Icelandic sweaters, that sort of thing. And this is one of those traditions that's, you know, not that many people uh, know about it. And it's very truly North American Canadian in its roots and, yeah. and indigenous on the West Coast of Canada. Yeah, absolutely. What about her new book? Well, we talked about her new book as well, which is this one. Yes. And um, as I mentioned, I am all about history. I don't read. I mentioned it, but I don't I read would a whole have no lot. Idea. And I like history. You like history. And oh I gosh. only, I pretty much only read historical books. I really yeah. do. I don't read fiction at all. And so this has, you know, everything about it. It's got the history. It's got the knitting stories. It's got other people's stories. And from coast to coast. And I mean, we do have a large, we're, we have a huge country. And from one end to the other, there there are different types of peoples in different environments, and, and the landscape is beautiful. She describes the landscape, and the landscape of the people is what truly brings it all together. Meeting people from wool shops that she encountered and, and workshops and groups. She had over 800 stories, and she had over 40 workshops yeah. across Canada. So it's all in here, and it'll keep you just giggling a little somewhat, fascinating you learn a lot and it's just a very heartfelt and a warm uh, heartfelt stories Canadian but stories when I picked this up there were a couple things I was surprised about one of them I did not expect to pick this up and learn anything about Canada because and when I say that I mean facts like I didn't okay. expect I there were a, a, a bunch of facts sprinkled in through the book yes. that I was so happy to to learn I thought that was great but also I just love the way that she um, tells the story and and really you get a sense of who Canadian knitters are and, and, and what their personality is like. Yeah, and, and, and you know there were a lot of sweater stories, personal sweater stories, which was a lot of fun. And she, I think, she got a kick out of that because she did share a few, you know, a few, a few of her personal stories as well yeah. along the route. Um, so uh, she gave a lot of herself in this in this book, um, but I think she was also, you know, she also had an incredible journey. Through, oh my through this, you know, not knowing what to expect when she left a six weeks, six week cross Canada um, tour and not knowing exactly what to expect along the way. And I think it turned into something absolutely, well, we know it turned into something absolutely marvelous and wonderful. How fun would it be to sit in the back seat um, of their trip? <laughs> Listen, yeah, because you'd cover every topic and. Um, I, I actually felt like I was sitting in the car when I was reading the book exactly. and traveling along. And we just exactly. finished our trip along uh, Lake Superior, and they when they hit that section of it, I, I just it brought back so many memories. That's but it right. was it was, it was absolutely wonderful. That. Yeah, and I've not been to the East Coast, so I feel like I, I have been there in yeah. some parts because of the personal anecdotes and stories and and the descriptions of the towns she's been to and towns I've never even heard of. And of course, the bigger cities, of course, she's been to as well. So yeah. it's all in there. Was there anything on the book that you want to read? Oh, I have to say, there is one very nice um, book review that I thought I would share with you. Well, there's right? three nice book reviews. There are on the three back. book reviews, but one in particular I found fascinating, and it reads Reading Unraveling Canada, I felt I was traveling across Canada with two close friends. Sylvia brings a unique perspective to, to the, her story that is both relevant and timely. As she explains, the historical intersectionality carried in every stitch of the iconic Cowichan sweater, she illuminates the Indigenous influence on Canadian knitting. This book is a must for anyone who loves a road trip and for those who want to gain a better understanding of the fabric that holds our great country together. Christopher Walker Cabin Boy Knits. Wow. Who would and, have thought? And I know that she was much appreciative of your taking your time to um, to go through the book and do what you did. Oh my gosh, it was, easy, it was so easy to do because the oh book is so great. The first thing you said to me was, Jamie, you're going to love this book. Yep. And he was absolutely right. And I, I, I said so to Sylvia, and I'm not quite done the whole book, and um, I'm just going to devour every word and have a few smiles and giggles and heartfelt um, stories one way. Excellent. I would highly recommend, I highly recommend the new book, but also working with wool and knitting stories. Knitting stories is great. It's a bunch of personal essays and patterns in it. 
Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend all three. I'll put links to, to it on the site as well. But I just, I love this interview. I, I thought it was great. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. All in all, I think it was just, we had, as she said, I mean, we just had a really good time. We just yes. had a wonderful chat. Um, and we, she, as she mentioned, she, we, we could have chatted all day. It was just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, very much well appreciated, uh, well, time well spent. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for joining us. And we will have more interviews on the way. We're looking forward to sharing them with you. And thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. And take care, everyone. Bye-bye.